I welcome you once again. Um, Dr. Chigun Spire is my name and I work with Enron Hospital Zana. So today we are going to discuss uh, a very important topic called optics in minimal access surgery. Optic in, optics involve um, producing a high quality image that would help you to smoothly operate. And uh, as you know that minimal access is uh, surgery of the image it means that uh, there is a lot of imagination, there is a lot of uh, um, uh, economics. So you need a very good image in order to appreciate the anatomy uh, of your planes. And that is the gist of our discussion today. By the end of our discussion, we should be able to um, identify uh, the equipment we need um, in optics. And that is the telescopes the camera heads, the light source, the recording systems. So that is the entire package of optics. We should be able to um, uh, be able to use this gadget safely on the patient. And we should be able to troubleshoot in case we have any problems. We shall start by uh, discussing the telescope. The telescope is the eye of the surgeon inside the abdomen. And the telescope is one of the most vital uh, components of optics. The discovery of uh, the telescope and uh, the integral components of its uh, function started way back um, in uh, around 1950s by a, a gentleman called Professor Hopkins. Professor Hopkins um, uh, came up with a breakthrough of the road lenses as we shall see and that is how the whole story about clarity uh, in vision, the minimal access started. So a telescope has three properties. The first the property of a telescope is the diameter. There are different diameters of the telescopes, ranging from the smallest to the largest. And uh, the diameter is important because the bigger the telescope, the more the amount of light that goes through the telescope. The smaller the telescope, the smaller the amount of light that will go through that telescope. The bigger the telescope, the bigger the field of vision. The smaller the telescope, the smaller you have the field of vision. That is why smaller telescopes are mainly used in smaller cavities, like uh, the uterus, the bladder, the joints, the ears. And then the larger telescopes are used in bigger cavities, like the laparoscopes used in the abdomen and the robotic scopes. So um, telescopes can be as small as uh, 1.5 millimeters. Uh, 1.5 millimeter scopes are used in arthroscopy and uh, uh, hysteroscopy. Uh, sometimes they are flexible or rigid. But the whole advantage of uh, smaller scopes is that they can easily enter small cavities and you can use them without anesthesia, for example, if you are doing office hysteroscopy. So the diameter of the telescope describes uh, what kind of scope you are dealing with. 1.5 millimeter scopes um, available, then you can have the 2.7 millimeter scopes, again used in hysteroscopy cystoscopy and urethroscopy. Then you have the conventional 4 millimeter scope. This scope is uh, widely known and used in hystroscopy for conventional hystroscopy. Most of the hystroscopes and resectoscopes are designed to accommodate this kind of scope. So it is a very important scope in hystroscopy. It is uh, a 4 millimeter scope. Then you have a 5 millimeter scope, and the 5 millimeter scope is called, uh, is, is used in mini uh, laparoscopies, a mini laparoscope. So if you are doing operations like, uh, which don't require much visibility, like uh, tubal ligation, simple diagnostics, taking uh, biopsies, or histology, and uh, other smaller surgical operations uh, like ovarian drilling, you are going to need uh, a 5 millimeter scope because with this scope, um, you, can, you don't have to put a big a trucker of 10 millimeters. 
you use a five millimeter choker which can accommodate this scope and that one maintains the cosmetic outcome of your surgery you have a 10 a 7 mm a 7 mm 7 8 mm scope uh, these are rear scopes but they are lateral scopes and uh, they are also available in that size then the common 10 millimeter scopes 10 millimeter scopes in diameter are lateral scopes lateral scopes are usually 10 millimeter scopes and these are the scopes we generally use for laparoscopy um, all these are 10 mm scopes from the 10 mm scope you'll find the 12 mm scope 12 mm scope is uh, um, a robotic scope it is a stereoscope it has two eyes unlike uh, a laparoscope and that is the scope we use in robotics um, the other property of the telescope is the field of vision that is the second property of the telescope how much field of vision does your telescope has will determine um, what angle of the scope uh, that you're using um, you have the zero degree scope a zero degree scope um, has no angle at the objective lens and it means that the angle between the field of vision and the optical axis is zero degrees. The angle between the optical axis of the scope and the field of vision is zero degrees. So this is called a zero degree scope. Um, then you have a 30 degree scope. A 30 degree scope is an angled scope. The angle between the optical axis and the field of vision in a 30 degree scope is 30 degrees. That means this kind of scope has 30 degrees more field of vision compared to the zero degree. You have other scopes that are 45 degrees. That means they have a bigger field of vision. And you also have scopes that are 125 degrees. Those scopes are generally used in super specialized surgery by urologists. They usually look back um, in a reverse direction. And those scopes are generally used to look at the bed of the bladder, the bed of the prostate, and um, they are quite unique scopes. So that is about the field of vision of the scope. So in other words, in the nomenclature of these telescopes, you can call uh, it takes the, the, the telescopes take their name from their properties for example this is a 10 millimeter in diameter 30 degree scope 10 millimeter 30 degree scope then this kind of scope is 7 millimeter zero degree scope and this scope is a 10 millimeter zero degree scope so that is um, how you 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 get into the nomenclature of, of these telescopes so don't get confused on how they get their names they usually derive their names from the from the properties the third property of the telescope is uh, the number of rod lenses Rod lenses are usually small prisms that are compacted within the shaft of the telescope. The telescope has four parts. This is what we call the objective lens. This is the shaft. This is the light pot. And this is the eyepiece. So within the shaft of the telescope, we find compacted small prisms that magnify the image at the same time transmit the light through the telescope. Those are called rod lenses. Modern telescopes have more than eight rod lenses compacted with small air pockets. The reason you have those air pockets is because when you connect, when you connect light onto the telescope, light usually produces heat. 
the heat is absorbed within the air gaps of uh, between the rod lenses and that protects um, your patient from being burnt at the tip of the scope but these rod lenses are very delicate they are very delicate that means that if you drop your scope then you are going to break the rod lenses and when you break the rod lenses there will not be any light transmission through the scope you look through the scope and you see darkness so protect your rod lenses protect your scope and that basically means that a telescope is one of the most delicate uh, components of optics and that is why the telescope moves from hand to hand it moves from the hand of the surgeon to the hand of the assistant do not combine the telescope with other instruments during cleanup because you are going to break the telescope and when you break the telescope you lose the telescope it is very expensive to have a new telescope um, the other bit about the protection of the scope it has a small glass small film of glass at the objective lens and that film of glass is protects the lens so when you break the glass moisture will enter your scope and you have clouding so avoid hitting the scope onto any object around you because of the changes in temperature from room temperature to um, a warmer environment inside any cavity like the abdomen the telescope tends to, to mist up so avoiding misting what we do is we usually have a flask on your trolley and you have warm water in the flask so you warm the scope for about three to five minutes before starting a procedure that helps to keep the objective lens um, a lot clearer and avoids the inconvenience of um, um, misting, misting your scope. So you take note of that. So those are the three properties of the telescope we've looked at today. One, the diameter, that is the size of the scope. Two, the optical axis, where it is zero degree, 30 degrees, 45, 125, um, whatever it is, that is the diameter of this, rather the, the, op the optical axis of the scope. Then the third property is the number of rod lenses. So if you're buying a telescope, you make sure that you buy a telescope with a good number of rod lenses, and that will give you a better image. And that takes us to the um, second component of uh, our optical journey and uh, that is the camera head. The camera head is a very essential and important component um, in the optical structure and the camera head has two parts. It has the coupler and the CCD. It has the coupler and the CCD. The coupler is usually detachable from the CCD in every scope. The coupler is usually detachable from the CCD in every um, from every make of the head and uh, you can detach the CCD from the coupler. Each coupler comes with a different design on how it works. We are going to go through that and we shall talk about the purpose of those two components. Um, the coupler is like the pupil of the eye. It is like the pupil of the eye and what it does, it couples the telescope onto the CCD. It couples the telescope, the, um, the eyepiece of the telescope onto the CCD. When you press on the coupler, it opens up like the iris of the human eye and it's able to accommodate the eyepiece of your telescope. So this is what we call coupling. So the coupler 
couples the eyepiece of the telescope onto the CCD onto the CCD that is the purpose of the coupler some couplers have a button you press down other couplers like uh, this is a, a coupler for striker but you have a coupler for um, calstros the coupler for calstros basically has a rotator button you rotate and then you can accommodate your telescope you rotate and let go you rotate and feed so you have to be cognizant of, of that so what about the ccd the ccd is called the car the charged coupled device the charged coupled device it has a chip inside you see that green component is called the chip the chip is the real technology embedded within the head of the camera head and it is designed um, that it has the technology to translate the image that comes from the telescope and that image is purified just like the retina does in the human eye before it is transmitted to the brain and in this case what is the brain of optics is the processor system a processor here for Carl Strauss or the processor here for striker so the CCD is responsible I beg your pardon, is responsible for the clarity of your image. So when you hear things like a 3D image, or an SD image, SD means standard deviation, and HD means high definition. So the purpose of the chip is to transmit or translate your image into an SD or an HD image. So the better the chip, the better the quality of the image. Modern camera heads have three chips um, compared to the previous uh, camera heads, uh, the standard deviation which had one chip or single chips. The, 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 the camera heads of the new generation have three chips. And what the three chip does, it usually purifies the image and uh, takes out the impurities. It interprets the three colors of the rainbow. That is R, D, B, red, green, and violet. Red, green, and blue, rather. Those are the main colors of the rainbow. When you mix those colors in three equal parts, 33.3%, you'll get white. So that one uh, takes us to the context of white balance. Before you start, um, working, you have to do what you call white balancing. We are going to demonstrate how white balancing works. Um, after coupling the telescope with your CCD, you connect the light cable with light on onto the light hub on your telescope. Once the light is on, as you see at the tip of the scope, you see light coming from the periphery of the scope. All scopes are designed in a way that light comes from the periphery. Then the image or the camera is at the center of your scope. This helps to give you a shadow. So when you're working, you have a shadow that can easily help you to interpret or get depth perception inside your cavity. So before starting, on any procedure, we usually start by um, doing weight balancing, and after weight balancing, we focus, we um, choose the, the correct zoom or the correct uh, magnification of your image. So the camera head has buttons, and these buttons can take you 
in the superficial settings of the camera. For example, if you want to do weight balance, if you want to do a zoom, if you want to uh, increase light or reduce light, take an image or record, you can find all the settings on the camera head. And uh, this is the only way we hold a scope. You use your two fingers to secure the camera head and avoid touching the coupler. Because if you touch the coupler, the scope might fall out. The light cable has to be quite flexible and gives you this small U-shaped angle. Do not leave a big angle of the, of the light cable because when the light cable drops, the scope might also change its orientation. So we leave a very small angle to allow us to um, protect the light cable as we shall see later, but at the same time to avoid interference, to avoid interference with the button so that I can now easily use my thumb to um, do any adjustments I need at the camera head. So when we are doing white balance, We get a white background and we press the button for white balance in a long press and in a long press the camera will tell you white balancing is okay. Then we adjust the focus. When you are adjusting the focus of the scope, you look at the diameter of your scope. So the focal point is derived from the diameter of the scope. If I'm dealing with a 10 millimeter scope, I have to do my focus at a distance of about 10 centimeters from the target. If I'm dealing with a smaller scope, like a 4 millimeter scope during hysteroscopy and cystoscopy, I do my uh, fine tuning or focusing at around three or four centimeters from the target because remember those cavities are small cavities. So that means if I'm moving my scope within the abdomen, it should be moving within a distance of 10 centimeters. That's why we do um, focusing within a distance of the diameter of the scope. So this is the button for fine tuning this, the image or focusing. And uh, in this case, you can spread out the piece of gauze or you can use any linen that you have. So when you spread out, you are able to see every individual fiber within. Um, so you focus until you are able to see every individual fiber within that piece of gauze. The same applies to a piece of cloth. You can focus until you are able to see all the fibers clear. Now that means that inside your abdomen, every single structure will be clear. Will, be, uh, will give you a very good clarity to perfection. You can zoom in or zoom out. You can zoom in or you can zoom out. So those are the three important buttons at the head um, of the camera, um, of, of, uh, at the camera head. And now we are going to discuss the deeper settings. What is involved within the deeper settings of the camera. Having mastered uh, those components of your telescope and camera head, we now want to look at the last component of this head, and that is the deeper settings um, embedded within the, the camera head. If you find um, um, yourself in a situation where you have to change the settings um, of the camera head, then you go into what they call the deeper settings of, of the camera. Now, what you do, you long press you long press um, the settings button and when you long press the settings button 
it will take you into the deeper settings of the camera. When you short press, that is what you get. And short press will take you into the menu. And in the menu, you are able to change the weight balance, you can change the enhancements, you can choose between uh, low, high, fiber optic, A and B. Fiber optic means um, purification, uh, uh, purification and removing impurities underwater. That's what fiber optic means. So, for example, if you're doing hysteroscopy or cystoscopy, those are situations when you work under fluid, in a fluid media. If you get bleeding, that storm of, of, of bleeding can be cleared by the camera. So that is what we call the fiber optic uh, component of your telescope. So you can choose enhancement on any of those aspects. You can also change brightness from medium, low, or high. For example, if you're using a laparoscope, you need more light inside the telescope. That means you set uh, your brightness to either uh, medium or high. If you're working under a stereoscopy where you need uh, less light, then brightness can be set to low. You can also change um, accessory. Accessory means um, assigning the buttons to tasks. For example, I can assign the first button as accessory one. I can assign this, the last button as accessory two. Then I say that accessory one will be for weight balancing. Accessory two will be for video shooting or printing an image. So that means every time you press accessory one, that will be weight balancing. At the time you use button 2, which is accessory 2, you'll be dealing with uh, video taking. You can choose to take a video or you can set the button as a, uh, a picture or what you call a photo. So that sends the image to the printer. That's what accessory means. Um, you can choose the shutter. The shutter uh, determines the amount of light coming in and out of your scope. And uh, the good thing is that by factory, a default, shutter is set at auto. Otherwise, you can change the shutter to any of these digits. But most importantly, for laparoscopy, the shutter should be 1, one over 50. That is for hysteroscopy, 1 over 50. And for laparoscopy, the shutter is set at 1 over 1,000. That is the speed at which light enters the telescope. Because in laparoscopy you need more light entering the telescope, that means the shutter speed has to be. And the shutter speed in hysteroscopy, because you need less light, it has to be slow. So that is the shutter for you. But if you do not want to struggle, just go in the deeper settings and set the shutter to auto. Then the camera will adjust the amount of light getting into your telescope automatically depending on the situation. Um, if you want to get into the deeper settings of the camera, then you have to long press. If you want to get into the quicker settings of the camera, you do a short press on the button. So if you want to get into the deeper settings on the long press of the same button, you open up a menu. That is a different menu, it's called the options menu. And in that menu, you have the camera functions. In the camera functions, you can assign uh, the buttons to any of those. Then um, you can do other things in the long press. Again, I do long press. So open up a menu. You can set patient information you can uh, do the setup wizard of the camera head so there are many things you can do with the camera head it depends on, um, on on the preference of the surgeon but it's just important for you to know 
that in case someone tampered with the settings of the camera head, you can get into the deeper setting and change the settings. You can as well customize the settings to your preference. Right. So the surgeon has to have a deep understanding of how to hold and use the camera head and what type of scope you are dealing with. For example, if I'm dealing with a 30 degree scope, which is, I mean, more popular for uh, the gynecologist, um, then you should be able to know where the scope is looking at any particular time. That one helps you with better camera navigation. Camera navigation is a very important aspect of minimal access practice for every surgeon. Because if you are to get a better optical experience, your assistant has to be able to navigate the abdomen well and you have to teach them how to do that so it means you have to know camera navigation much better than your assistant in the OR for example if you are using a 30 degree scope the eye of the scope is at 30 degrees that means if I want to look down my light cable will be at 12 o'clock if I want to look at the ceiling, then I have to drop the light cable at 6 o'clock so that I'm able to see what is above or anterior. If I want to see to my left, then I turn the light cable to face my right and then I should be able to see what is happening on the left side. If I want to see to my right, I just turn the light cable and be able to see what is on the right side. So this is the art of camera navigation. You do not have to move the head, um, the camera head, because if you move the camera head, you change the orientation. If you look at the screen, if I change the orientation of the camera head, then the image will rotate. The image is supposed to be in a way that the camera head is always at 12 o'clock. If you change the orientation of the camera head, you change the anatomy within the abdomen. So you have to just move the light cable. Um, this is in contrast to when you're using a, a, a zero degree scope. With a zero degree scope, you don't have angles. It is very difficult to work within tight spaces. Um, now that we've looked at the, um, the preliminaries into our journey of optics, we've appreciated the telescope and how it works. We've appreciated the role of the camera head. Um, we all know that in order to um, be able to work within a dark cavity, uh, for example, the abdomen or any other cavity, you need light. And that takes us to another important gadget called the light source. Of course, the light source um, gives you light, but it is important for the surgeon to know how the light source works. Um, there are different types of light sources in markets, um, depending on the, on the manufacturer. You have, for example, this is Carl Strauss light source. Then you have uh, a Smith and Nephew, a Striker, and many others uh, you come across. Some of them are even anonymous. But the principle of the light source is that it works under two properties. The first property is the intensity of light. The second property is the color temperature. So the surgeon needs to understand those two properties very well. The intensity of light is the strength of that light and usually it is um, the strength of the light source apparatus. Um, as a surgeon, you need to uh, buy a light source that is at least above 250 watts in strength. That will usually give you um, um, good light during surgery. Do not buy a light source that is less than uh, 50. The good light source should be a range in between 250 to 400 watts. And this is how you 
change the intensity of the light. The light source comes with an increasing button. You can increase the intensity of light, make it stronger. You can reduce the intensity of light depending on your preference. You can even choose to pause. There is a pause button. You can pause and restart. Pause, especially if you have any interruption, you don't clean your scope, you have to take a laparoscopic rest break, you can pause. And the purpose of the pausing is to reduce on the burning out of the bulb. Because most of the bulbs used in a light source uh, have um, uh, a half-life. Um, the common bulbs we use in, uh, in, in most of these gadgets are the halogen bulbs. Halogen uh, has uh, um, a half-life of about 3,500 watts. And if you keep using it, the lamp power will burn out over time. That is why you need to know, especially if you're buying uh, a used equipment, how many lamp hours are left. Most times when you switch off the gadget, for example, I'm going to switch off this gadget, I'll switch it back on. This small display is supposed to show you the remaining lamp hours. 1,487 lamp hours. So uh, that will tell you uh, I'll give you a picture on when your lamp is about to expire. Of course, the lamp that goes within this gadget costs about $1,500, and that is not cheap. $1,500 to replace a bulb, so that's why you need to protect your bulb. The other property of light is the intensity, rather the color temperature, color temperature. The first property of light was intensity. The second property of the light source is the color temperature. Color temperature is the father of light. Every light has its source. The father of light is the sun. So the intensity of the color temperature of the sun is about 35,000 35, watts. 35,000 watts. And uh, every invasion of the bulbs um, is in such a way that you need to get as close to the color temperature of the sun as much as possible. With the halogen bulb, we said it is 35,000. That is almost a half um, of what, I beg your pardon, uh, the halogen lamp is about 1,400. The LED, which is the most recent bulb, is half the color temperature of the sun. And that is about 35,000. And that is why lead is brighter than the halogen bulb. If you're using lead light, you get brighter white light. If you're using a halogen uh, bulb, you get light that is a little uh, lukewarm, kind of uh, uh, yellowish. And if you compare this to the previous tungsten bulbs, the color temperature was so poor. So uh, the manufacturers keep on improving the color temperatures of the bulbs to get closer to the color temperature of the sun. Who knows, someone might come up with another invasion where they go quite closer uh, to the color temperature of the sun, uh, much closer than what we have in LED bulbs at the moment. So those are the two properties of the light source. And uh, most of the light sources have um, these provisions where you put um, the hub of, of the light cable. And uh, it is their design in such a way that they can accommodate all the different designs of the pins of the light cable. You see, this is different from this. And these two are different from this one. And this is also different from so there are different designs of uh, the pins of the light cables but each of them can be accommodated in the light source you just rotate you keep rotating to get which fits where you can fit if 
it doesn't go there, you try the other one. If it doesn't go there, you can try the other one. That's how uh, these things work. So for example, if I connect this cable, then I have to turn into that provision of light. If I have to use this cable, then I have to turn until... So any of them can be accommodated by the light source. So you don't have to worry uh, um, about the type of the light cable you have. So all light sources come with that provision. Right, the next thing we are going to talk about is the light cable. The light cable is just a conduit that transmits light from the light source to the telescope. It transmits light from the light source to the telescope. We saw that the telescope has an optic hub and the light comes with such an intensity that it can burn. It is so strong. Uh, for example, uh, as we say that most of these gadgets are about 400 watts. The light at the tip of the light cable is so strong that if you put it, for example, anywhere near a piece of cloth, you can get a fire. So that is why um, you need to protect your patients by avoiding um, putting the light cables uh, near the patient. The light can be so strong, the intensity that it can cause a fire. So imagine if that light is put on the patient's skin, you can get a fire in your OR. So how is the telescope designed to avoid such? The telescope is designed that it has the road lenses, it has air pockets in between, in between each road lenses which will absorb the light before it gets to the tip of the objective lens. So you will never get a burn from an objective lens of the telescope, but you can get a burn from the tip of the light cable. So never drop your light cable on your patient unless it is standby. Right. So let's look at how the light cable works. The light cable works under the principle of total internal reflection. The principle of total internal reflection. Uh, we know as a principle of physics that uh, light is transmitted in a straight line unless it is deviated by um, any lens in front of it. You can only deviate light if you have a lens. It can be a convex lens, it can be a concave lens. But other than that, light is supposed to travel in a straight line. Now, there is another principle of physics that when the fibers transmitting light are less than 0.5 microns, then the light, that light will move to the adjacent fiber. Can you increase the light there for me? The light cable is designed in a way that it has nicely glittering less than 0.5 micron fibers. Each of these transmits light. Each of them. Each individual fiber transmits light. Now because they are less than 0.5 microns, the property of light sets that the light will get transmitted to the adjacent fiber and together as one they produce a stronger bright light. So that is the principle uh, behind a light cable. Unfortunately, these fibers are very delicate. See how easily they break? The fibers are very delicate, they easily break, so we handle them with care. And that is why the only way of handling a light cable, as we demonstrated earlier, is in such a way that this one fits in such a way that it never bends. The light cable should not bend at an acute angle. It should always be laxed. So that these fibers 
should not break in due course because if you keep breaking the light cable the, the, the fibers then you're going to reduce the amount of light uh, transmitted through your telescope so one of the um, the the ways you can troubleshoot if you're not getting enough light into the patient you check your light cable if the if you get more than 10 percent fibers broken then the amount of light going to through the telescope will reduce so if you want to protect your scope and rather if you want to protect your light cable you have to hold it gently you either hold it like snake well wound for storage so that you don't break the fibers. This is the way we keep the light cable. Or alternatively, you keep it straight. Avoid this kind of thing. Avoid tensing your light cable because you are going to break the fibers. If you have more than 10% of the fibers broken, then you have to change your light cable. And it doesn't come very cheap. All right. So that is uh, the light cable for you. That is the light source for you. Um, troubleshoot. If you do not have enough light entering your patient, there. Uh, these are things you should look at. One is your light source okay? Does it have enough intensity? Um, does it work well? Does it go on? Is it powered? If the light source is well, then you look at the light cable. If the light cable has more than 10% of the fibers broken, it will not give you good light, you need to change it. If the light cable is okay, then you look at the telescope. And as we said, the light comes from the periphery of the telescope. You put the light on and look at the telescope. If the telescope does not transmit light well, despite the fact that the light cable and the light source are well, then your telescope and the road lenses are damaged. So you should be able to troubleshoot um, why you're not getting enough light into the patient. Because light is everything, we need to keep our surgery brighter. Um, having looked at all the other components and gadgets, we can now talk about the last bit of optics. And that is the, um, the monitor and the recording system. Um, you know, after getting a very good quality image from um, your telescope, your camera head, um, the image is usually interpreted by this beautiful uh, gadget here. And this is what you call the processor. Um, this is like the brain of, um, of the video. So the image is transmitted to this gadget and then from this gadget the image is split to your recorder and to your monitors. Um, this gadget is uh, so nice that you can set it uh, on, in any provision of the surgery you want to do. You can set it uh, in the laparoscopy mode uh, according to any speciality that you wish. You can set it in the laser mode, you can set it to um, the microscope mode, Standard, uh, that means it picks um, um, uh, the modality of surgery depending on, on, on what you're doing. It can be arthroscopy, cystoscopy, ENT and neuro, flex, ascopes, for example, you're doing office hysteroscopy, hysteroscopy. So you can, you can choose the, the mode of surgery you want to do. So once the image gets here from the camera head, it's processed and distributed to the monitor. The monitor um, has a knob for the settings. When you rotate the knob, it will take you to the input. That means that you do not have to worry about which cable to use. It gives you several provisions. You can use the analog, you can use S-Video, C-Video, S-OG, HDMI, uh, which are the back of your trolley. And uh, when you look at the back of your trolley, this is our camera hub. We have a camera hub at the top, 
this is uh, Carl Strauss. We also have another camera hub here of Striker. You realize that it gives you all the provisions. It gives you all the provisions from HDMI to S video. Um, depending on, on, on what you have, you can you can you can use any of these gadgets, SDI. Um, so you split an image from here to the recorder. Image goes to the recorder for recording, but also the image crosses to the monitor. And then from the monitor, you can also choose to display or split the image to different monitors in the OR. You can have monitor one, monitor two, monitor three, so that the entire team is able to see what you're doing. It even has a provision of telecasting so that you can uh, throw the image to any conference room in case you want um, your surgery to be visualized by another audience. So that is the beauty of the camera hub. You have all those provisions. Um, the medical monitor is designed in such a way that it can accommodate um, bigger number of pixels. So if you have a high definition image from a very good um, camera head, then you need a high definition monitor so that the monitor is able to accommodate the pixels coming from your image. So basically what that means is that please try as much as possible to get a monitor that has enough pixels to accommodate a good image. Do not get SD monitors, the standard television monitors. Get an HD monitor. Even the usual televisions we use at home are HD. So if you cannot afford to buy a medical monitor, you can get any of the uh, HD monitors. They will give you a very good display of the image. Uh, lastly, every minimal access surgeon should be able to record. They should be able to take a record of uh, uh, their procedures for purposes of archiving, for purposes of research, for, for sharing with the patient, and uh, for medical legal issues. And uh, that is the reason why all of us should know how to record, retrieve, and archive. Uh, there are many recorders on market, uh, which, you, which you see, but basically they do the same thing. Um, you, they have provisions for, for, um, for a CD and a provision for, um, for a flash disk. So that means that uh, if you have a flash disk, you insert it here and you're able to retrieve your recording. Then in your free time, you can use the available software, play around with your video, edit it and customize it, brand it for the consumers. So I hope you enjoyed the journey of optics uh, straight from um, knowing how the telescope works, the technology behind the camera head, the camera hub, the light source gadgets, the monitor, and the recorders. And after that, you should be able to um, enjoy your optic experience, be able to troubleshoot, at the same time, um, be able to use this equipment safely with your patient. I pray and hope that this information and this video will help you to practice safely and enjoy a very good optical experience.